Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, how goes it, everyone? It's a wonderful night here on a Monday, starting off the week nice and strong. Happy to all the people coming in, but yeah. <sighs> it's been a long day, long day to say the least, but thankfully I don't have a lot of work going on this week, so that means I get to do a whole lot of time Um Streaming, working on videos, the whole nine yards, that kind of stuff. So everything's everything's kind of good. Was good is the Brandine, the one, the only. Check out um for anyone interested, check out Brandon uh, Skull Ghidorah on uh, DeviantArt. Guy does amazing stuff for paints. Um. I've done at least three customs by him, two Godzillas, one other kaiju, which is the Varen figure I've had. I posted, I know I did post the Godzilla, the gemstone Godzilla that I gave the Stan Winston colors, and he upgraded Varen. I sent those down to him, and he does an amazing job with the figures I send him, so if you guys want to commission stuff by him, um, I totally recommend you guys do so. The guy does amazing work. But... There's that. Other things in the news. Um, New Empire is doing good in terms of numbers. At least I know that. Um, obviously, I still have my opinions on the film. I am still going to do a few more shorts concerning a few things in regards to plot points, ideas, things of that nature. The like there's just a lot of things i think that are wrong with the film and then i'm still working on another video in relation to a lot of the perceptions around how things are going um so there's that feet fire this is the kaiju not with pocho the great defender hi what's uh the worst tv show velma she hulk rings of power sin and secret invasion both or i've never seen these so I've never watched Velma. I've watched some of She-Hulk. Well, I've seen... The only one I saw to completion was Rings of Power out of the ones you mentioned. But I've seen clips from all of them. Um, my opinion is that, like, nowadays, I can pretty easily tell if something's just not going to appeal to me by trailers or early clips that we see. So it it comes to a point where i'm like okay the trailers aren't really doing it for me i'm hearing what the directors are saying so i'm just gonna avoid it and then more extended clips come out and i'm just like okay yeah this is bad and then i'll just watch the show to explain why it's bad like um there are so many people who have talked about all these shows that i feel like i don't need to like work on my second channel to get my points heard in regards to these shows so there was that, um, but like, I guess where it concerns these shows, um, I guess if I had to pick one out of the ones you sent me, it'd probably be Santa Inc. Because like, I really don't know who the show's for. Um, at least a few of these are Marvel ones, and it's they, they all have like the people they appeal to, but I don't think anyone's not found saying I ain't funny, but yeah, like for example, I guess in more recent news, the Fallout show is gonna be coming out, and the director had mentioned that he wasn't even making it for Fallout fans. And I'm like, if I'm someone who who already is invested into this IP and you're gonna make decisions that aren't really gonna adhere to the story, and then you're also not doing things specifically for like people who are what built the franchise, then I don't need to waste my time um, looking at what it is that you've made. So that would, that would be my um, statement in regards to that. But yeah, so Start off the music just for a split second because I was gonna wait till 10 minutes and I was gonna do just a little bit of animating on the blender, but I I can't find where the GRX model is. I know um I still have the email from the guy I commissioned it from, so I can still just rip the model from that again, but 
That just means there's going to be two files on my computer because it's not letting me recover the last time I was working on it, which sucks, but it is what it is. So I was going to do that for about 10 minutes and then start um, the main thing I was talking about, but I guess might as well start now. So what we are talking about today is, and I have to share my screen for a little bit because I have to do a little bit of screenception for this wonderful uh, stream right here. So streamception for a little bit. And yeah, we're talking about Juan Eroche Cartel's King Kong, the Black Gorilla. So from quarterly review of film and video, Mr. Rocha Cartel, um, I think teaches at a few universities, um, specifically Spanish one. Um, this is where I got the PDF. The PDF for anyone wondering is in the description on YouTube. So if you just so happen to be watching things via Twitch or you are watching them via Facebook Live, in that case, I apologize. You're probably going to have to find it via YouTube. Although, when I'm setting it up on StreamYard, it let me keep all the descriptions the same. So hopefully, the you'll be able to meander your way through the descriptions of the streams and find it that way. I know um, StreamYard didn't. Uh, record and save the stream from last time from Twitch. So that sucks, but there's that. But the reason why I wanted to do a thing on this paper, I was going to say this wonderful piece of media, but it's not media and it's not wonderful, is because of things like this. Now, I had actually done a, another stream from Overly Sarcastic Productions on this specific video because i know that a few other um creators had talked about the comments made here in regards to king kong and the allegorical nature of the character i know um names far bigger than me were talking about this specific video and the reaction to it because i do know um, red had made some posts back on twitter the best place for community discussions definitely obviously um, I was like, oh, people are getting mad again about check notes, something I said about blah, 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 something mad, apes, allegory, racist, blah, 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 virtue signal. Um, so, yeah. And I'll just play it for context for all you guys to understand. This is King Kong, which is pure spectacle. On the subject of King Kong, there's think pieces about various ways it can be interpreted, but I don't think it's exactly controversial to suggest that a movie made in the 30s about a giant savage ape who is captured by white men, transported across the ocean in chains, and then abducts a white woman could possibly have some racial coding involved. And for the sake of my comment section, please do not try to defend the political sensitivity of a movie made in 1933. Can we just accept that the giant ape is probably racist? Okay, moving on. Now the so thing there's that. Um, and I only needed that just for specifically the audio to be heard there. So now I can transfer over to a regular share screen because it's not going to hurt me anymore, or at least in the worst way possible. So for people wondering, coding and I guess social... Sociology, probably the best way. So, social media. Yeah, I love when my computer does things. And social science coding is an ethical process. To do. There's that, which isn't what I'm looking for. Probably we'll do racial coding. It is another form of covert discourse race that uses racial charts, radicalized terms in order to distinguish explicit or implicit racial hostility. So, at least one game for when it comes to something that's coding, it's where you're not using implicit terms to make a point across, in which my dog whistle, I guess, technically would be a better term. So we'll use, we'll do dog whistle just because. And probably I'll have to use it for like Urban Dictionary. You hear dog whistles all the time and you, you forget that, oh yeah, dog whistles are a real thing. Yeah, the act of using coded language phrases or even when you say specific things to a specific group. So. That is what someone means when they use the like coding or things of that nature. But the reason why is because King Kong the Black Gorilla is one of those quote unquote think pieces that talks on the idea of King Kong being coded or a dog whistle to racist ideas because it's in the 30s, people are racist, yada yada. There is that. So 
that that is why. And for anyone who can obviously see, you're looking at 46 pages, unfortunately, of this. I may split the stream up into two parts. I'm probably going to do, we'll see where we get by about 10, 10 30 ish. And if um, we're not done by 10 30, then we'll stop there and make that a part two for next week when we'll also do another round table. So that's going to be fun for everyone. But let's begin. And I'm also going to talk a lot slower specifically so that everyone can take in what is here. So King Kong, the black gorilla introduction, crisis, fear, and xenophobia in horror cinema. Although I guess King Kong could be considered a horror film or horror cinema. It is mostly considered like an action film. And it's really only the later films that delve into the horror of Skull Island, but details, I guess. Research question and starting hypothesis. Since the premiere of the first version of King Kong in 1933, one of the most widely accepted, most, yeah, one of the most widely accepted these, uh, this is, I think, translated too. So if there's anything weird in terms of words or spelling, that's probably why. So one of the most widely accepted these probably themes and specialized literature that the film has a racial or a racist content. However, recently some authors have qualified this discriminatory discourse or have even questioned it. In this regard, the research question is to what degree of depth is the film racist? And the starting hypothesis that the crisis of 29 its driving force intensifies the imaginary fear of the whites to the black race or of the black race represented by the large dark skinned gorilla. To confirm this hypothesis, a content analysis of the cinemato uh, Cinem uh, cinematographic images will be carried out a heuristic based interpretation based on a largely interdisciplinary bi bibliography and the film production will be framed in the social economic political legal cinema cinematographic cinematographic why am i having trouble with that word in cultural context manifestly prejudiced and discriminatory towards citizens of color specifically as well Specifically, as will be seen, King Kong exhibits the fear of white workers as they imaginary feel that black citizens take over their jobs in times of massive unemployment. In addition, the film echoes the ideology of the patriarchal, colonial, and racial system that makes people of color invisible, that shows the desires and fears of a repressed sexuality that relates it to death symbolized by blackness and that, in short, it creates an imaginary cinemagraphic universe that deepens and increases differentiation and social exclusion. So let me move that away and get that. And for context too, I also have here with me the movie via in an archive. So if we need to reference something, we can use that here. So already we're off to a wonderful start. I think a lot of the reasoning for this idea might be circumstantial stuff. Yeah, probably. Force you to talk about a goddamn monkey. Yeah, well, um, actually, King Kong is an ape, and as a gorilla, you cannot therefore say that the um, King Makong is of the racist varieties because he is an ape, not a monkey. But. This guy is going to try. The debate on racism in a 1933 version of King Kong. In recent years, there have been publications that have generated a debate about the extent to which the film is racist. These have insisted that viewers perceive the gorilla as a cute animal where they feel at the end of the film sympathy and admiration for him and his romantic love for, for Dara, which leads him to die. And for anyone questioning, they have all, all the... Um, different little sub notes here are going to be at the end, so we'll see where he's pulling these from. But I don't really think it's there's going to be much worth in it. But by virtue of this same sympathetic portrayal of the enormous ape, T. E. Wartenberg questions in two thousand one pages two to eighteen whether King Kong is really a xenophobic film, since according to him it breaks new ground in the criticism of Hollywood's racist representation since it represents a pioneering attempt that although timid criticizes the xenophobia of the time to argue his thesis he argues that the film attempts to refute the stereotype of colored men understood as sexual monsters which inaugurated the birth of a nation 
To this end, the film first replicates the same structure of racial representations of people of color it seems a savage beast, but not so much to defend it as to question it. So, what he's saying here is at least this person is saying that the film is not racist because it's kind of challenging these ideas of xenophobia. And for anyone who watched the old other stream I did on a bunch of King Kong videos about things being racist, um, there was one guy who had said that, oh, in the film, they talk about how King Kong is a savage beast that had never been seen before by white men. And like, that means colored people don't matter. Of course, that's not what he specifically said, but essentially it can be further that what he's meaning is that because white men haven't seen it, then therefore there's no like inherent value taken from it. But let's just go over what I said here. Um, a pioneer attempt that criticized the xenophobia of the time to argue that, well, it's criticizing xenophobia, but let's go down to at least here. And of course, I'm not going to have that blasting in my own ear. None of y'all are going to hear this, but at least if we're using what's going on here, I would say probably the best attempt to refute the idea that like the film is not exceptionally racist or as racist people would like to believe is the fact that for a 1930s film, they did a really good job in terms of not casting people in blackface i can't say for certainty um but i do know some people said that this guy is actually a person blackfaced but that is noble johnson so we'll pull up noble johnson for you guys So, one of like a like a really huge example of someone of color who had worked a lot in the film industry, and I think it does say it here. Um, where is it? Yeah. Do, 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 do. I it may not be here, but I do know like. A, he did a lot specifically to help out actors of color. Um, so that is one thing I wish was here. Yeah. Does it say here on the Wikipedia page? Yeah. May it say right here. His pay from the films and like, like much. Private, but... Yeah. Yeah, he was also an entrepreneur founding his own studio, the Lincoln Motion Picture Company in Omaha, Nebraska, with his younger brother. The Lincoln Motion Picture Company was an African-American film company that produced what were called race films made for the African-American audience, which was largely ignored by the mainstream film industry and was the first to produce movies portraying African-Americans as real people instead of as racist caricatures. Um, I think the reason why this is significant and would provide a better argument is that if the people behind a 33 film were as racist as this author wants to portray them as it would behoove them not to hire someone. Although he had worked with RKO in the past and he had done films like here's his filmography. Even before he had worked on King Kong, he had been in many films, but do you think someone who would go on to fund a motion picture company, which was championing and producing films specifically for like, African Americans and for a black audience, and even giving them a foothold, you wouldn't think that they want someone like that to be a major part of the film. Not to mention the fact that the chief, that's him in the movie, is um, that is Noble Johnson. And you'd think that they wouldn't want someone prominently adding to their film to like just even be involved because probably it'd be a lot easier and probably more beneficial to an extremely racist film company to instead of hiring a bunch of black actors and one who would go on to fund a African-American film company to like work on the film in the first place. 
I always find it weird that people who talk about this concept always emphasize dark skin real when girls are naturally dark skin animals. They make it sound like it was a deliberate choice. It's funny that you mention that. I know there's another paper that doesn't say something about gorillas, but it's about um, a scene in the film. But we'll we'll get there when we get there. But yeah, like I, I guess the main point I want to make is that the best argument that you can make about trying to shy away from xenophobia or viewing black people more as people rather than as below people would be you don't want to hire um, someone who would go on to be a big part in terms of helping uplift the black community. Although you could say that because of his involvement in all these films, that was just a happy accident. But I think it says more to the filmmakers that they were very much okay with having a large black cast, but also hiring a very well-known actor. And they don't treat even the Skull Island chieftain as exceptionally stupid or um, bumbling. Like, obviously, these guys interrupt the ceremony, and instead of, like, trying to treat, well, Englehorn trying to treat with the king as, like, he's some kind of idiot, they're very much this understanding that they're kind of barging in, and all they want is peace, and the king is within his rights to kind of be like, what, what are you doing? Like, get out of here kind of way. And, of course, Carl is a... The thing with Carl Dedham is the fact that he comes off as more naive and sort of golly gee willikers about the whole experience in the first film and him being more villainous is hi not hyped up but more emphasized in later adaptations like the dino de Laurentiis picture the 05 one especially and the broadway picture but overall it's more like a it's definitely more of a case to where these actors and this character isn't portrayed as just simple, stupid, and unequipped to deal with the dangers that they're dealing with. Because unlike the Skull Islanders who have done what they can to upkeep a wall and have been able to stay pretty well secured, once Kong's free in New York, it does a lot of damage and they have to resort to like a last ditch effort to end up killing him. So there's that but going down here yeah yeah so we'll we'll start here to this end the film first replicates the same structure of racist representations of people of color convinced conceived as savage beasts but not so much to offend it as to question it and it does so by replacing the men of color with a real monster that retains all the sexual characteristics that the racist stereotype attributes to them however the sexual desire for for kong humans is maintained which places the transgression of interracial sexuality with that of the natural boundary between the species so basically what he's saying is that i can't really argue against this point so i'm going to say oh well they just moved it on to something more dog whistly which in that case, if they're trying to code it more, then why not just be more explicit with it? Because if we're saying that the time period is racist, then therefore there's no reason to hide anything in racism or like in metaphors and the like, because if everyone agreed to, in terms of their feelings about the matter, then trying to hide it or put it behind the allegories and metaphors of a monster seems kind of silly and ridiculous. Because you wouldn't really need to... Actually, it would be more expensive to create a picture like King Kong to express this allegory when, like they said, birth of the nation is a thing. And essentially, they're the same thing in terms of talking about the evils of colored people. Which, birth of a nation definitely is, but King Kong is not. However, Wartenberg recognizes that despite this quote-unquote progressive position, King Kong retains two important elements of segregationist stereotype of the time the patriarchal es um, estimation of women and the view of the island tribesmen. Indeed, the women are represented as objects of desire for men, white and colored, although Kong does not feel the same way about the colored virgins who are sacrificed and killed as he does about the golden-haired woman with whom he falls in love, save repeatedly and for whom he ultimately sacrifices his life. This means that Western standards of beauty are seen in the film as superior to those of other cultures and peoples, in this case, those of the black race. Thus, King Kong continues to legitimize the racist and Eurocentric system of aesthetic value or evaluation of no, aesthetic valuation that specifically denigrates women of color. So 
when it comes to this point here, and actually I'm going to stop the recording here because we're going to switch over to specifically what they say in the film because I think Carl honestly says it best. So I want to see. Hopefully <laughs> I'm sharing so much of this film. I'm like, oh God, I'm, he's just streaming it get taken down. But let's see. What you he's... got her into this venom. Yep. So let's move him away. Let's go. But... The gift for Kong, he says. Good Lord. Let's go back. Yeah. Costco! What's that? Must be the witch doctor. He says the ceremony is spoiled because we've seen it. Well, calm the old boy down. What's the word for friend? Mala. 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 Punya! Stay with those rifles, boys. Again, and was it intentional for myself, but it, it once again shows the point that, yeah, they're viewing them as just completely savage or uncivilized that they have to resort to violence. It's mostly a, we don't want any trouble. We're just kind of doing a thing, which again, they're in the wrong. And of course, in Sangha Kong, the whole expedition is blamed solely on denim and everything resulting from it is blamed on denim. But yeah, these guys are idiots. They're not savages. Of course, that what their culture requires of them is different. And we see that later when the villagers do also try to help in terms of holding back Kong because they know how dangerous Kong is. So there's that. But. Sita. Malum. Malum What's that? He says, look at the golden woman. Yeah, blondes are scarce around here. Malum Apicano. Kong war Bisa. Kao Bisa for Kong. A gift for Kong, he says. Good Lord. So, if we're going back here, the problem originally was that the witch doctor believed that the ceremony is ruined because of the intervention of these foreigners. But once the chief sees the, um, or sees Anne, he feels that, oh, because of how different Anne is, if we sacrifice her to Kong, we're all cool. And essentially all is kind of forgiven because he's not like we're going to take her from you. We're going to kill you kind of thing. It's more like, yep. Um, we'll make it a trade and it's not a, Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, we're so terrible. We're awful. And we're going to take your woman because we're savages and evil. And our women are just so worse. And I know that in a, develop not developers a um, director's commentary for the 05 version it's overtly stated that jackson had kong intent on killing Anne, regardless of who she was and thankfully well we have jackson there specifically to state that that was the intent behind a scene in this case we don't have merit e. cooper to say otherwise that now nope, that like this he was going to kill Anne regardless but we gave him fatuary because of this way or the next at least from what we can stay here from the dialogue, it can be inferred more that the reason why um, they why Anne wasn't killed was because she was just unique and different, and because of that novelty, that's why Kong took her instead of just outright killing her. Because we don't necessarily know what happens after the bride is taken. All the islanders know is that once the girl is taken. Kong leaves and they're safe. So that's why they perform the ritual in the first place. So in universe, the only reason why the guys go after Anne is because they care about Anne and they have no intention of living on the island. So it's not like they have a reason to sate Kong in that aspect. Well, the villagers, they aren't leaving the island. So they have to find some way to not be killed. So there's that. Let the bro cook. And how's it going, sea monsters? How's it going? Mm -mm, monkey. Uh-oh. Stinky. Boom. We'll go back to this right here. I 
I love all the gobbledygook I have to go through just to find my place in this fucking thing right here. However, Wardenburg 3 recognizes that despite this progressive episode, is, uh, yeah, it does not feel, yeah, it denigrates women of color, so. In relation to the members of the tribe, Wardenburg perceives that these natives are the only black human beings present in the film and that they are also represented through the standard discrimination of their time and that is that they are exhibited as primitive people living in fear and virtually identical to the savages. In fact, they show their anger and fear by sacrificing virgins, which the limited intelligence and culture that populate the films, the film of Tarzan the Ape Man exhibited before King Kong novelty. So I guess we will stop there. But um probably won't find this, but Oh, demographics of New York in 1933. Probably won't find anything of importance, really, because it's only. But we'll go to we'll go to several places at least. Um, so 1930s. So. We'll see here in terms of demographics here. So you have this entire population for whites. You're looking at about 95.08%, 4.73% 4 for black, 0.9% for Asian, other, and then Latino Hispanic isn't counted. And it's really interesting in the 50s and 60s, it's not. But I love how weird demographics are always counted, accounted for and things like this. But Let's see, 1930s, Manhattan, and that's all it's going to show me for that. I love that. But the reason why at least I bring this up here in the case, although it's only a overview of the population for New York in that entire uh, decade there, is because when we're looking at this, you have a super small percentage of... Um, Blacks to whites, which is going to explain why you're finding so many other um, just white sailors in the movie. However, since it's right here, I, I, I almost I almost got it perfectly. Let's go back because I want to at least get that. And he's right there. Yeah. So you only have actually only one character who is Chinese or Asian, and I. Now I'm trying to remember off my head if this was even another caricature or someone who wasn't actually Asian, but I think he was. But you only have one Asian character, nameless black characters, where you have titles for them, and then Charlie doesn't even end up on the island. So after you see him on the boat, he doesn't appear at all, and he isn't killed. So the only people you actually see die outside of the natives are the white sailors, but... What a King Kong 33 casting. Mm. Yeah, no, that's again an interesting fact that you see. Not really anyone who's I like. A, you have a, a lot of um, black actors, which again, good for them. But yeah, I do think it's worth Victor Huang, who was who is Charlie in King Kong. But let me make sure just to be safe. A three. Nope, it's not. It is Victor Wong. That's what I thought. I'm not sure why I didn't show it for them. I, th I I was pretty sure that it was. And the guy's also Chinese too, so there's that. But going back. The novelty of this author is that he makes evident the presence in the film of both xenophobic and non-racist elements, but 
the interwoven and complex way in which they are present makes it difficult to defend that the film openly possesses an anti-racist ideology. For example, by Kong being considered a cute animal, on the one hand, the film in invites viewers to identify with the black exotic suffering, being cruelty crushed by white technology, this being who is capable of love, but on the other hand, paradoxically, this has turned him into a domestic figure to the point that the racial struggle characteristic of the moment is softened and even annulled. Um, so when it comes to how King Kong is portrayed in the 33 film, Marion C. Cooper, we do know this, was wanting to make King Kong like the scariest monster imaginable and really didn't see Kong as necessarily a character. However, it is because of Willis O'Brien and his work as a special effects director behind the film and working on all the scenes and interweaving his own thoughts and feelings into Kong, which is what gives him his more human-like characteristics, which in a way does elevate the original themes that um, Kong was neither beast nor man because you're having that line pull between both. Is Kong really an animal or is Kong more than that? And of course, we see that portrayed more in things like the MonsterVerse. We see it weirdly expressed in the Dino De Laurentiis film as anyone knows when it comes to my feelings on that movie, I think it does disservice to the idea of king kong and it also causes essays like this to have some kind of legitimacy because of the sexual like undertones and weird stuff that was going on with that film but details details um so the like the only reason why kong has more cuter elements is because of the person animating him I don't think that that's like an example of, oh, we're trying to emphasize with the, like, or empathize with the idea of black struggle. I think it's more has to do with the fact that although Kong was a monster because Cooper was animating him and putting himself into his work, that he put some of him specifically into the character. And therefore, that is why in universe Kong acts the way he does. And that serves both the story and our ability to empathize with his later death. I, I think that. Overall, you have to come to this idea that the uh, King Kong was already an idea, like a racist allegory. You have to come to the idea that King Kong was challenging the, uh, these ideas of racism to begin with. And then that is why you can draw these conclusions. But let's see if... Cause, yeah. So once Kong is finally at the gate, you have both natives, white men alike trying to fend off Kong from breaking through because it's, it's very clear that like they and the sailors have no idea or like not no idea. They have no desire to let Kong break through because of how destructive Kong is to all of them. And then once Kong does break through, you have again, the settlers trying to do what they can to fight against Kong. Like they don't like if Kong is supposed to be like an allegory for black men, then why is it that the apes like the the apes geez you don't have the natives doing what they can to like help kong fight against these people who have invaded their home and kind of let their god run free like you have to stretch or you have to just ignore scenes like this altogether, or you really have to bend the logic to even consider the premise that kong is anti-racist or kong is racist like no kong is just like a monster and that's why like you have scenes like this where kong's just like killing people like i think people can tend to forget that like kong did kill people in like the original film and killed a lot of people like he's not completely blameless for things that he does like you could say quote unquote acting in self-defense but after he breaks through he's just like he's going to town on some of these people but First of all, first of all, the first thing, I love that. First of all, the first thing to say is that there are numerous ambivalences about racism so that some aspects seem more discriminatory while others, on the contrary, are more critical as a worldview. But we must not forget that this ambivalence is typical of the racial, colonial, patriarchal ideology and the social dualism that permeates it. So look up social dualism. So... 
The clashing of an imported social system, usually high capitalism against an indigenous one. So that is what they mean by that. An example, traditional versus new, like, yeah, new rich versus poor, stuff like that. Or rich versus poor, traditional versus new. Like these clashing of ideas, which I think describes this paper more than anything else because they're trying to say, well, King Kong is racist because of this, this, that. And then within the film, you see instances that don't make it as simple as how they're at least portraying it to be but here's like you see that like once if you look at the film and you see how things are not as simple as this that's when you get like oh social dualism maybe like well it's not dualism because we have interviews and like directors and the people work on saying otherwise like therefore i understand that king kong swings more towards the racist idea since as we will see in this article the preservation of xenophobic stereotype are even more numerous and deeper than those pointed out by Wartenberg, without forgetting that the very type of fear that's behind the creation of the film is, as I have just indicated in the previous sections, a feeling that is congenital. A, I am so tired. I love these words. Congenital part of the ideological and social system in which the horror film is contextualized. No, it's not. Like, the film King Kong was originally for obviously the people in the audience who know just gonna be like a gorilla fighting a Komodo dragon, a literal monkey fighting a literal lizard. And then you had like the idea of a lost world with the original plan for creation. However, from what we do know of creation, which is where like the dinosaurs, the lost island, and all of that comes into play, there was no actual natives on that island and of course there was no kong in that story but the reason why we have the addition of kong is because of the idea of merging the gorilla idea with that of the dinosaur so instead of a gorilla fighting a kimono dragon you have a giant monster like a giant monster fighting a t-rex and then because of uh, Mary C. Cooper had worked on ethnographic films in the past. That's why you have the addition of the tribal elements to contextualize the idea of someone being captured by the monster, which again was just to heighten the stakes and the tension by having a character that we like being captured by the monster. Because again, Cooper had no real desire to have Kong be sympathetic and more just wanted him to be a terrifying monster. And as a previous source with C. Cooper, you have these conflicting ideas, which just um, are injected into the product but a lot of people who write these kinds of articles don't see that and just sort of are like whatever um me think racist so therefore racist victor wong from tremors um is that the same victor wong well, let's let's check um so fine tiger i don't see I don't see tremors there, but since Vic asks, we will we will take a look and see. Victor Wong. Oh yeah, he was in Tremors, so that's interesting. That or did I just miss it then? Probably. Hmm. Yeah, three ninjas. Yeah, so tremors. However, Victor Wong here. Yeah. Different Victor Wongs, actually, because Victor Wong born September 24th, 1906. This Victor Wong was born July 30th, 1927. So actually a different Victor Wong. Let's keep going. In this sense, must we kept in mind that the romantic love, the great passion, the greatness of this passion, that is the surrender of the ape's love for life of the protagonist, is what makes the monster humanize, according to Wartenberg. However, this model of love, which emerges at the end of the 7th century and defines early modernity, constitutes an in inheritance of the courtly love of the feudal system 
and of the love passion characteristic of the absolutist aristocracy linked in true to platonic eros and christian agape and associated therefore with western civilization and the prevailing patriarchal system that characterizes it moreover insofar as it is literature cinema and television soap operas that represent revive or recontextualize it it should not be surprising that it contains a literary component even a melodramatic one Looked more to the mental than to the carnal, more to passion than to sex, and that, therefore, it constitutes an ideal, certainly not too progressive. So, like, essentially, it's like, there's this idea that, like, beauty killed the beast, and we'll, we'll go back there, because we'll, we'll pull up the Arabian proverb, which, in the Lindsay Ellis video, um, she told us that, yeah, it's neither an Arabian nor a proverb, but it's something that they made up for the movie. So if we are being generous to the film and implying meaning where there is, well, implying more meaning than there was probably intended, then you could technically say that there was at least some um, like Abrahamic idea of love because the proverb is an Arabian one. So there is that, but I'm not going to try to stretch it too much in this, but like this whole section here is utter garbage. There is nothing of value that comes from this. And I am going to, I'm just going to pull up word for the sake of it. I want to see how much is actually pulled from just words alone for how many like lines is said here. Just to add to that. Yeah, you, you have 122 words that mean quite literally nothing. Like, none of this adds to the point that you're making. Because if the monsters humanize and therefore there's some kind of love going on, but because, like, there's a patriarchal system and, like, these systems have traditions to them that aren't progressive, therefore it's not progressive and it's not love. Like, utter BS. Finally, there is a strong argument that the film contains more segregationist features, mo most and more important than anti-racist ones. And it is that, as some historians argue, in the 1930s film production was increasingly governed by the logic of marketing, that is the commercial one, that need to sell many that that needs to sell many tickets and therefore satisfy everyone, especially the xenophobic society that is, as we have seen, the majority, and secondly, the anti-racist much more minority. This explains why King Kong is an implicit, is an, uh, we're going tonight, and I, I'm happy that I didn't really read over this earlier because I want all these reactions to be genuine because this is what happens when you deal with academic text because you'll get like a lot of words that are big but really just don't mean much. Oh, just elliptical. I thought it was elliptical, but at least definitionally when we're using in the context here. Yeah. It, uh, what what is being said here is that well, the society as a whole is xenophobic. There's probably small anti-racist there, so you could argue that yeah, there's gonna be some anti-racist elements, but because the xenophobic society is the majority, therefore King Kong racist. Which, again, stupid based on what we've seen in terms of the text and what we can see here from the film. And we should go here. And this explains why King Kong is an elliptical text and conveys its meanings in an indirect and rather sublime, sublime stylized, and codified way. Moreover, this um, corresponds to the film being a mixture of archetypal formulas and traits, highly mixed form formal structures, and in short, a pastiche of various genres rooted in a series of popular formulas and conventions that circulated in the 1920s and the early 30s, among them the dominant xenophobic ones that marginalize individuals of color. So more gobbledygook we have to translate. So if we're looking at pastiche... A pastiche, by definition, is an artist work that imitates another work. So you could say that King Kong, because it is a jungle film, is trying to ape, pun very much intended, the work of Journey to the Center of the Earth or The Lost World by Vern and Doyle, respectively, which are films about lost lands filled with prehistoric life 
encountered by white men. So that's why you could consider something a pastiche in this sense. But I, I think the whole idea of pastiche um, implies that the character, like everything is trying to be imitated or parodied in some way, but it says like, unlike parody, but so pays homage to the work it emulates. Like, if someone is influenced by, for example, giant monster films and you make a giant monster film yourself, it's not pastiche because you're not trying to imitate other giant monster films. You are taking influence from other films or other works to then make your own. Um, it gets a little bit more muddy when like maybe you are dealing with characters who are written by other people and you finally got to written them yourself, but because like you may not write in the style of the original author you are then trying to emulate the style of that author. So a lot of like Conan stories that were written by Robert E. Howard, but written by other authors trying to have a similar style to the um, works of Howard are indeed pastiches because there's a certain style being replicated, but even ignoring King Kong, the film actually made, if we look at the basis for creation, instead of a um, jungle plateau, with the Lost World, you have a Uncharted Island instead of a scientist in the form of Challenger. You have a shipwrecked crew. So, like already, um, the idea that makes up the backbone of the world building of King Kong is so different from the work of other Lost World type media that I think it wouldn't be fair to call it a pastiche. And I think that if you're calling it a pastiche, it's trying to imply that the work isn't as original as it actually was and instead is more trying to copy what was around it to try to be as popular as possible which i guess technically you can argue that a film about a lost world is less original than the idea of having an actual ape fight an actual komodo dragon but i'll take the chance that some intellectual calls me racist or um, copying another person's work than actual animal abuse, but that's just me, I guess. And I got a Facebook love from someone. Thank you for that. But we'll keep going. As we've seen, the majority and secondly, the anti-racism are minorities. So with this, again, like I said, because... May, the society is xenophobic and we have a lot to establish that therefore that's who you're appealing to rather than the anti-racist or more accurately probably like cooper has said and because there is evidence that people had asked about the allegorical meanings of king kong and cooper has denied that that more than likely he wasn't trying to appeal to the xenophobic or the anti-racist he was just trying to make a movie to escape from the depression but there's that so we'll move on the social, economic, political, and legal cinema, uh, cinemographic and cultural content or context is in New York manifestly prejudicial and discriminatory towards citizens of color, economic crisis, fear of people of color, and horror movies. The crisis of 29, which shook and troubled North America between 1929 and 1933, represented above all a failure of the economic system, but also a stage of transition from a series of institutions and social forms to a very different one. Hence, the monetary or financial motivations join the weakness weaknesses of the international systems. In any case, the great world economic crisis of 1929 breaks a phase of two centuries of long growth and leaps to a deep depression of agriculture and industrial production that brought with it massive unemployment. The 29 crisis was also accompanied by a great migration of people of color seeking employment. Although it began in the 19th century, it was revitalized after the First World War due to a series of factors, economic, racial violence, droughts, weevil pests that affected cotton cultivation. These important human motivation movement, oh, yeah. these important human movements, more than 7,500,000 5, people in the 1920s, produced mainly from the south, southern states to the north and particularly towards New York, brought considerable structural changes, demographic, social, urban, economic, political, and cultural. So, oh my gosh, it brought me all the way down there. That's why you don't, that's why you don't touch the small little numbers, because then it's going to drag you all the way down there, and then you're going to lose your place. But mm, we'll go right here. 
So like all of this right here is just setting the stage of like what was going on with African Americans around this time or like people of color during the 20s. So interesting information on this, but we'll see how relevant it actually is. And I'm almost going to do another thing here in terms of putting all this into a document to see how much words are actually spent on what may or may not amount to anything. But we'll start here. These important human movements, more than 7,500,000 people in the 1920s, produced mainly from the southern states to the north and particularly towards New York, brought considerable structural changes, demographic, social, urban, economic, political, cultural. In addition, they, motiv they motivated between 1880 and 1940 rejection panic and the increase in prejudice of white populations towards migrants whom they received with suspicion and hostility since they were branded as criminals alcoholics as bringing venereal venereal diseases or illegal illegal emissy and ridicule with epithets such as vulgar dirty and noisy furthermore white workers Imagine at the time of the severe economic depression of the 1930s that their jobs were in jeopardy, when in reality, employers were offering people of color jobs of lower strata, of poorer quality, those who did not want the, the white whites and those who offered the worst salaries. In relation to this, they are perceived as a threatening presence. They were racially generated, segregated, and isolated, marginalized, and pushed to live in urban ghettos, making 1940 the most critical moment of all. Again, 1940, film came out in 33. In these ghettos, they were forced to develop a city within the city, an almost parallel economy and society, and thus an economic racial bifurcation. In some, immigrant workers were restricted in the residential and occupational opportunities available and were systematically excluded from high-wage jobs, job security, and movement opportunities. In this way, as had also happened in the South, the labor market was divided, generating a conflict between the poorest whites and the people of color that often erupted into violence. So the poorest whites and the people of color that often erupted into, or the poorest whites and people of color. That would probably exclude Marion C. Cooper, considering the fact that the guy was fighting in the wars, moving around, making pictures. So it's not like something he was dealing with or probably something that he had any great experience understanding or really tapping on in terms of something that probably was on his mind. But since I'm feeling just about happy in regards to this, let's just copy all of that. That is all of what I just read, and let's see how much is actually wasted. That's 403 words that all it really is is just talking about what's going on in the Depression era, but nothing else of that, nothing that's actually relating to King Kong. But let's keep going. Entrepreneurs of color, for their part, were hampered in practices, institutions, and legislation, the process of their businesses, the maintenance, and the growth of their pro other properties and the competition with white companies. In fact, the historical rate of African American entrepreneurship is in all industries relatively low. One of three of all one of three of that of whites. And this is not exclusively the product of the traditional culture theory that argues African American culture is the main factor. Today the thesis is making headway in academia that as the black population increases, so does racial hostility that seriously damages the close relationships between service providers of color and wealthy whites. Therefore, these contributed to the disappearance of traditional black businesses in the North to the extent that whites stopped buying or consuming in their companies to this is added that the city's legislature put putting obstacles or restrictions compared to other communities, such as the Korean one that progress more quickly. It's funny they mentions the Korean one and doesn't relate it back to King Kong. I guess good on him, but would have been funny considering that Charlie's actually Chinese, but there's that. Plus, um, again, what does any of this have to do with King Kong? But I finally see the word King Kong, so we'll see how, how this is all related. In short, inclusion practices were encouraged. There was clear racial segregation and clear discrimination against African Americans. This explains why their social ascent was limited and constrained and that they had to survive in difficult conditions inside his ghetto. Although certainly economic activity did not totally disappear and even prospered, while cultural activity, music, literature, theater, and the press experienced a period of creative flourishing. Along with that, the year King Kong was produced, the United States of America was immersed in racial segregation and the violence it generated between 1870 and 1840. Racial violence increased dramatically. Black business districts were looted. Entire black farms businesses were destroyed in the South Port in 1990 and into the North after that day, reducing the value of commercial and residential property. In the South, men of color were tortured and killed with some, reg with some regularity between 82 and 1930, 655 people. While white populations remained favorable or indifferent in the North, the criminal justice system juries can black men. Again, like you're going, like we can go through all of this 
And outside of the fact we're saying around the time King Kong came out, this was going on because there's black people in the film and because society is racist. Therefore, we can infer the racial feelings of the creators at this time being racist. But um, at least what we can say is we can go to this right here, 1870, 1940, and let's just see what Cooper was doing at the time. See, Cooper. So I'll bring that over. So Cooper is born in 93 um, or 1893. So obviously this started in 72. So 93, that's 23 years before he was even born. But in 96, he joined the National Guard and was down in Mexico. And then World War I in 1917, which, again, we're saying 1940. So just doing basic math. So around this time of free saying in 1917, that's like 20-some-odd years where Cooper is not really involved in what is going on in America because of World War I. And then, of course, Cooper had spent a lot of time in Europe, which I'm just kind of letting everything sit here because... There's so much that can be said about like, oh, well, in this day, in this day, we can infer here that stuff was going on, and that's why King Kong is bad. But when just looking at Cooper's life, things just don't match up. Have you seen the Monster video on King Kong? I haven't watched it myself because it was talking about how Kong is racial metaphor in the thumbnail. Monster. Um, not to my, not to my knowledge. But I, I might have. I really might have. It just doesn't come to my attention, or at least I'm not thinking. I like I can't think of it at time. I can't think of anything. Um, but see, look, racial prejudice. Blah 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 blah. You know, I think Ozzy Kyle's Jamaican, but neither here nor there. But Monstrum. Oh wow. That's funny. I did not even. Well, this is um, it's by story. I didn't even know about this. I I'd seen um, at least the thumbnail for this Wendigo video because of like just doing Wendigo stories. But no, I had not seen this. Wow. And I just clicked out of that. No, <laughs> maybe that's a sign of things to come. Just don't. Don't delve back into it. You don't want to know. Um, this is only nine minutes. So you know what? What I'm going to do is that we can compare this together because at least like a lot of videos that talk about like King Kong being racist usually like reference ideas that are going on in these well these papers. So let's see what's going on in this. We'll share the screen and yeah. And there's an ad playing, so that's fun. Let me skip the ad, and then we'll just delve right into the video here, and then I'll pull back up the article. So, Streamception, let's go. That's funny. Thank you for bringing that up. That's I, At least I have something like interesting that I can talk about that's a little bit more interesting than the paper which has almost like so little to do with King Kong and just talking about like what was going on at the time. One of movie's most iconic moments. King Kong perched precariously on top of the Empire State Building. In what would become an international phenomenon, King Kong revived a struggling studio and birthed a canonical monster that has endured for almost a century. King Kong, as both a character and a film, is commentary on greed, social economics, and a disturbing snapshot of racial politics in America. Oh, boy. I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, and this is Monstrum. Quick recap of the 1933 film. Real quick, did you say doctor? I hope she did not. I'm Dr. Emily Zarka. Oh, you did. Wow. This is Monstrum. Oh, God. Quick recap of the 1933 film. Carl Denham, a filmmaker desperate for his next box office hit, 
hears rumors of a mysterious deity called Kong living on a secret island in the South Seas. Determined to make the rumored monster the antagonist of his next film, Carl heads out with a hired crew to capture Kong. One member of the group is an out-of-work actress named Anne, played by iconic Hollywood beauty Faye Ray. On the island, the group interrupts the ritual sacrifice of a woman to the fabled Kong. The natives, angry at the interruption and inexplicably captivated by Anne, decide she would be a more fitting tribute. I don't get what you would say inexplicably, considering the fact that they're trying to sacrifice someone that they consider beautiful to their deity, and if they are like, wow, a person is very unique, let's probably sacrifice Kong because more than likely we'll have better favor with Kong. There's a lot of rather innocent things you can imply in terms of what the natives could be thinking that isn't just mm, racist, me like white women better than black women, therefore Kong like better because in world people think racist, so blah blah blah. Like it's so stupid. The foreigners attempt a hasty retreat to their boat, but Anne is later kidnapped and the natives string her up as an offering. An infatuated Kong carries Anne off with Carl and the crew in pursuit. The rescue party discovers not only the massive gorillas, but living dinosaurs on the island. Cut to a battle between Kong and Tyrannosaurus Rex. During the fight, it becomes clear that Kong isn't a threat to Anne. He's actually her protector. But despite Kong saving Anne from the dangers of the island, he is captured by the search party and, ever the colonial fantasy capitalist gentleman, Carl absconds with Kong back to New York City. He opens a show featuring... I mean... You can say that Kong is her protector, like, even though he isn't gonna try to, like, overtly hurt her, he's still, like, taking her against her will, and it's very clear that Anne does not want to be there. So, just because Kong's protecting her does not necessarily mean that Anne wants to be in that position. Bring Kong as the eighth wonder of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, look at Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> As you can guess, this does not go well. Kong escapes his chains and captures Anne, whom he believes to be in danger. He wreaks havoc. Well, we don't know whether he thinks she's in danger. He's just infatuated with her. Upon the city and famously climbs the Empire State Building before being shot down by the military. Falling dramatically to his death. The movie was produced by two filmmakers, Miriam C. Cooper and Ernest B. Shodzak. Cooper claims credit for crafting the original story. One of his inspirations was a friend's unsuccessful attempt to display two Komodo dragons at the Bronx Zoo. Another was watching a plane flying over New York City skyscrapers. And Cooper drew heavily from a 19th century travelogue, Explorations and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. The book includes a recounting of a gorilla who supposedly took a female villager into the jungle. Monster horror films from the time, like The Gorilla and The Ape, featured gorillas violently murdering humans. There's also King of the Congo. Yeah, because like the gorillas had only been recently discovered, so like the idea of like these giant animals being villains is not outside the realms of possibility, especially considering the fact that we have so many other examples of villainous animals across media. I think probably had Kong even not been made, we'd still have movies like Jaws and others like Anaconda because of the idea of man fighting against nature. Which probably isn't a coincidence that the title resembles the King Kong namesake four years later. Well, the only well when it came to Kong, we the only thing I can remember off the top of my head when it comes to the idea of Kong was that. They added the idea of King because it would be assumed that the name Kong would have been associated with, uh, interestingly enough, like a Chinese name. So that, that's why they added the name, where added the King part to King Kong. But again, it could be, it could be implied that yes, the re the name Kong came from um, Congo, but circumstantial. This one involves ivory smugglers and a giant gorilla who at one point threatens the protagonist with a gun. A quick aside here, though gorillas are rarely aggressive, 
popular Western opinion at the time stereotyped the species as rampaging, violent, untamable beasts. So, let's just pause out here real quick. Uh, go. Our first discovered, 1847. So, not a long time in the span of things. So, like, that's when the first drill cell was collected. Was in forty seven. It's only the fifties when you describe when they, when they were described. So you have fifty years until like nineteen ninety, and then uh, thirty years. So like almost like around the same amount of time between like us and Kong. Do you get like this idea and this mythology of gorillas being like monsters? But yeah, and a stream session myself. I love that. And Cooper leaned into this trope. He even wanted to use real gorillas in the attack shots in the film. Oh, and have the gorilla get into a fight with a Komodo dragon, which I guess kind of made it onto screen in the T-Rex versus Kong battle. And that was only possible thanks to Willis Harold O'Brien. He was the stop motion and special effects pioneer behind Kong, while Marcel Delgado was the sculptor behind Kong's famous form. O'Brien might actually be responsible for making Kong a giant. He sized the creature up in an early concept portrait, making Kong's first encounter with Anne more frightening. While pre-production of the film staggered along, hindered by a rotating door of scriptwriters and financial setbacks, RKO Radio Pictures was headed for bankruptcy after a string of box office busts. They needed a hit and needed it fast, so they put everything they had into King Kong, marketing the film's groundbreaking special effects and over-the-top plot as a spectacle that had to be seen to be believed. Kong himself was also a spectacle a terrifying monster on a rampage of destruction. Ads of Kong on top of the Empire State Building shocked the park, and one trailer featured only a giant menacing shadow. And it worked. All 10 shows a day were sold out during opening weekend in New York City, in the middle of the Great Depression. Record-setting attendance was followed by glowing reviews that praised the film's technical achievements and thrilling plot. It made about $2 million worldwide upon its first release and single-handedly saved RKO from bankruptcy. The harsh truth is that King Kong's success highlights the Western tendency to fetishize and exploit foreign cultures. King Kong's influences give us a perspective into the history of conquest and colonialism. Both filmmakers, Cooper and Shodzak, previously worked on films documenting wildlife and human inhabitants of exotic locales, and jungle adventure films were a popular genre of the time. These movies set in, you guessed it, the jungle, show predominantly white characters exploring a faraway land. Classic example, Tarzan of the Apes, and its many, many, many sequels and spinoffs. Tarzan himself became king of the apes and embodied the noble savage trope. Then there's 1922's Jungle God, which featured a kidnapped white woman who becomes the goddess of an African community. Overall, there's a lot of racist and colonialist tropes in this genre. The white adventurers... Again, sure. However... It, when it comes to Tarzan, just because you have Tarzan, white guy, king of the apes, and is in the jungle genre, that therefore, because you're also in the jungle genre written by white people, that therefore, you can create such an easy one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, you can like, the most that you can be said is at least that, um because if the idea of like taking over foreign cultures or explaining them is bad therefore um what carl denim is doing is bad therefore carl's the villain in the story sure but then kong goes on a rampage and ultimately kong is killed and we see in a following story featuring denim in the same continuity that he's facing the consequences of these actions and ultimately his whole arc in the second film is making up for the mistakes he did by literally getting Kong killed. So it it just comes from like a lot of there is a tentative association based on the time, therefore racist bad. That's from stereotypically portrayed natives who were constructed as uncivilized, violent, and obsessed with white female beauty. But another no, let's go back as uncivilized uncivilized not really they have their own culture and they've been able to keep kong away from the walls and they were smart enough to ally with the white sailors who they just kidnapped from and there's no tension between them 
again, we could say that, oh, because the film was moving to New York, they had to press everything along, so therefore the writers just forgot, which there isn't enough to really say that in the film, but okay. I guess violent because they were maybe going to throw hands with the natives, but after um, there's like an altercation that's not even on screen, the natives don't even fight with the crew members. You really only see natives fighting with the crew members in mostly the 05 version, which is when they're at their most um, like evil, quote unquote. Um, but yeah, they're not really violent. The only character they overtly fight on screen outside of and when they're capturing her is Kong. You can't really call them obsessed when there's only like they've only encountered one person and because they had a ceremony ruined and they think that, oh, probably what's been keeping the wall going will be even better because of something special and unique that they're bringing. Therefore, they're obsessed. That's jumping the shark or jumping the monkey. But another nefarious influence on King Kong's story may have been the faux documentary racial exploitation film in Gazi. In the film, African women are offered hmm. sexual sacrifices to gorillas, essentially pornography that grotesquely demonized interracial relationships. The 1930 film would be pulled from theaters under the Hayes Code, but not before reaching box office success. It was one of the highest grossing Hollywood films that year. This financial success likely fueled RKO Radio Pictures' investment in King Kong's creation and distribution. They just needed to monetize racism in a less obvious way. Okay, so... Oh, no, and I am literally just pressing everything today. So let's actually look at that. And... Nagi. I'm going to show this one, alright. And Gagi. Gagi is filmed from the 30s. And... Distributed by Congo Pictures. Another pre-code, pseudo-documentary exploitation film. Yeah, a real sex rape. Production, which the film featured was taken without permission. So, at least the film came out in the 30s. Let's see. That's how the film, uh, film came out in 33. But... Like, considering the fact that the movie had been going through so much development hell prior to 33, I think it's, it's really unlikely that um, this could be seen as influence. I think the only reason why is because here, because it says, oh, yeah, like even here it says it was, it's success motivated Arcadia to invest in the like third of King Kong. So these right I was shown, including one of the first. So the only connection that can actually be drawn here is that because RKO owned one of the theaters that showed this film, and because it had a gorilla taking people, that therefore um there could be the belief that there was an investment there. Like that's such a leap and without like direct evidence, I I wouldn't, I couldn't say in good faith. Like I would even say that like, this is possible. I would say like this was going on at the time, but like it, it comes off as like kind of deceptive that they're saying that because how do they say it again here? Essentially pornography that grotesquely demonized interracial relationships. The 1930 film would be pulled from theaters under the Hayes Code, but not before reaching box office success. It was one of the highest grossing Hollywood films that year. This financial success likely fueled RKO Radio Pictures' investment in... Yeah, it's really funny to say it likely. We don't know that, and there is enough proof to actually say that, 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 that it's true that that likely was the case, because 
let's actually go back to this production release. Yeah, considering how much like went wrong with this pro with this um production, with them stealing footage and all these lawsuits that it's saying, like more than likely this this wouldn't be like something that seems to be like, yeah, let's definitely do this. This is a good idea. The following films released multiple parties were published that were skeptical of the film's authenticity in response had filed a lawsuit investigation. The film was fraudulent, deceptive as his man's here for the last result. Conversation of the removed, it, removed its sanction on the film in 1947. Film critic. And how, so this is a contemporary film critic. It is a loose assemblage of the usual show, many of which are spoiled by extraordinary bad photography. The screen is a miserable blur for mentioned time. The scenes were grills last but 10 minutes are not all convincing, but note that the chopping of life. It must be generally interesting. The photography is poor. The eight poor men are seen to him, but shadowed. Show without concern. She could be seen wearing last taxi cameraman. Like, what can even be said is not be like, oh, yeah, this is really like, hmm, we like this because racism. It's fucking stupid, I swear. Like, what can really be said about this film other than it came up before King Kong and it was about an ape taking woman? And because that's already a trope, then that doesn't necessarily mean that th this film was an influence on King Kong. Kong's creation and distribution. They just needed to monetize racism in a less obvious way. Considering the overt racism at the time King Kong was produced. Kong's place in the dark history of dehumanizing people of color is undeniable. Comparing people to and portraying them as gorillas, monkeys, and orangutans was a common practice at the time. And these undertones in the film would not have gone unnoticed by moviegoers in 1933. The so-called savage ape, dark and menacing, obsessed with the beauty of a white woman he seizes for his own, was a pretty transparent metaphor for racist fear. There's also the fact that Kong's physical journey from his native land to the U.S. to be exploited for profit aligns with the narrative of enslaved people. That, oh my goodness, I love that. Um, I Every time there's a mention of King Kong being taken away, it's like, oh, it's just like enslaved people because people see, or white people see black people's monkeys, therefore, because this happens to Kong and black people are called monkeys, therefore, there is that direct comparison that's stupid you're stupid for thinking that and please don't make videos in the future saying that but what's funnier is i remember when godzilla versus kong's trailer was coming out and critical drinker made that exact point and people were like bro why are you seeing that it's not what it means but like people who like talk about king kong are like oh this is totally what king kong means it's just a double layer of hypocrisy um but King Kong appears at a time when civil rights deprivations were fueling calls for equality and housing, employment, and education. King Kong can be read as a metaphor for how black men were treated, and are still treated in America, as both glorious spectacle and violent threat. Kong no. Um, it's probably because, yeah, Mayor C. Cooper wanted to see something with a gorilla. Will O'Brien had an idea for Lost World Project. Cooper was like, oh, uh, doing something with real grill is really difficult. Probably can't happen. What if I take this idea that's already going down um, via RKO and mix it with my own project? There we go. We get King Kong that way. And considering all the interviews, contemporary and otherwise, that talk about this in that light, that's more than likely. Evokes the dangerous, exotic other, but he is also a sympathetic character that the audience is meant to identify with. Kong triumphantly clutches the top of the needle in one hand and Anne in the other. He has not just conquered the city, but the world. At the time, the Empire State Building was the tallest building in the world. He towers over the symbol of modern civilization. Cooper stated that part of the creature's inspiration came from a desire to place a symbol of prehistoric life in the modern mechanized world, and have a modern weapon, the airplane, kill him. In a press release for the film, he said, why not place him at the pinnacle of the tallest building? 
symbol in steel, stone, and aspiration, and hit him against modern man. Of course, as a foreigner on U.S. soil, Kong's triumph is short-lived. A revived RKO Radio Pictures followed up the success of King Kong with a quick sequel, Son of God, released just nine months later. But then, no new contributions to the franchise until the 1960s. Sure, there were re-releases that drew big crowds and established a global audience, but nothing new was added to the story for almost 30 years. And when those changes came, they would be pretty big ones. He wreaks havoc upon the city and famously climbs the Empire State Building before being shot down by m the military. Sorry. <laughs> and they don't even talk about his relation to Godzilla or like Willis O'Brien's attempts at trying to revive King Kong stuff or anything else. Wow, that's disappointing. The whole paragraph again, anyway. That's that's stupid. That is un that's awful. And that person is an actual doctor and was the writer for this. That's that makes me sad. Like I I don't know what to say because uh, outside of like that makes me sad. And so I feel like you guys care about that our animation. Yeah, she also made a video on Godzilla, which she, which she seems to give Mothra more attention, showing her strong feminist within. Why is the top of the Empire State um, building cropped off? I think probably the reason they did that was because in the 05 version, he knocks part of it off and when he's standing on it, whereas in the 33 version, he doesn't. He's just sort of like on the side of it, um, which I guess makes sense because they're going to try to like combine all the different aspects going on with King Kong at the time. They didn't even talk about any of the remakes. Yeah, because it doesn't matter. They wanted to talk about how King Kong is bad and racist because it was the 30s and people compared black people to monkeys, so therefore racist bad. So of course they're not going to talk about um the like anything else that may or may not like destroy the narrative that they're making. But that that's awful. There like there's so little in terms of research that was provided there it just makes me wonder like what was even the points like you barely go over what was going on with like the production of king kong or any direct influences on it or things like of that nature instead you just talk about like why things are going bad in depression and because black like there was stuff going wrong with black people in the depression and because people call black people monkeys or compared to the monkeys that therefore we can unequivocally say that king kong is racist because of that um, like it's just it's just stupid. It's ridiculous. Wait, what happened? I wasn't here. Like liter we did the Monstrum video on King Kong and talked about that because um Martin Caspi Smith had brought it up, so I was like, oh, why not? Um we can bring we can talk about that and I looked at that video and that was that was bad. Um, so <laughs> now nah. I was going to say, yeah, I don't normally tell people mass dislike something, but no, like I, we don't need to do that, but it, it is kind of sad that that's ultimately the most they could do for the monstrum segment on King Kong. Like there is nothing else to talk about the production or things going on with it, but yeah, but let's go back to the article here because let's just see yeah well there's a ton of stuff between that so what i'm probably thinking is yeah i know we ended on page six of this which we will go back to here at the middle and display that again but they can because almost none of this was like explained here because we'll, we'll end it we'll end it off actually instead at horror films and colonial races the monster in the space and time he inhabits because much like the video a lot of this is retreading but because i do remember we mentioned here um but Consequently, this is well, we'll start here. Consequently, this is linked to the social control of sexuality solely applied to men of color and white women to maintain racial purity while sexual barriers preserve white power and authority. 
we know that it is in the times of traumatic situations, generalized crisis, and especially economic ones when horror films or fantastic films flourish, when, spontane when spontaneously reflects sympathetic attitudes of collective unease, as evidenced by the rise of the film industry shares with these genres and the considerable increase of its business, Peter N.A. Because, um, yeah, going over here, essentially, to talking about how... Um, a lot of black people and people of color had moved up from the South and because there was a lot of inequality and a lot of white people figured that black people were taking their jobs. There was a lot of violence there. And because there's a lot of unrest that that's why you see fantasy and horror films on the rise. And because fantasy films on the rise, they may tap into some kind of attitudes. And therefore, because essentially, like we said, black people are compared to monkeys. Monkeys are portrayed as like evil, savage and like, lustful and all that that therefore yes like it's just tiresome i guess but that's what at least peter na says here that crash hill is referencing but true horror cycles appear in periods of social tension so that the fantastic terror genre becomes a medium through which the fears the anxieties of this stage can be expressed Possibly this occurs because of the, the distribution of cultural gnomes both conceptual and moral provides symbolic for those times in which the cultural order has collapsed or is perceived to be a state of decay. And the fact is that although terror constitutes an expressive form that seeks its own internal harmony, by nature it deals with the interharmonious, the monstrous, the rapture of harmony in the world in the interruption of the horrible and or fantastic. Again, all gobbledygook, but essentially because times are tough, people are going to try to find escapism by seeing people encountering troubles of their own and overcoming them. That's why things like that occur, especially horror films. Now, horror cinema constructs the emotion of fear and transforms it into a conscious feeling. Indeed, this emotion is transformed to feeling that, beca that because the fear provoked by fantastic or horrible cinema can be of two types, physical or emotional, and metaphysical or intellectual, it first has to do with physical threat and death. The second, which is more typical and exclusive of the fan of the fantastic genre, despite the fact that it usually manifests itself in the characters, affects the spectator more directly. Finally, a fear can be understood as the fruit of the conflict against the unknown, insofar as it manifests itself as the motor of a process obligate obliged to perennial circular iterations since it feeds back by being both cause and effect of the ignorance of the phenomenal world the unknown generates fear and this appropriates the creation of myths or appropriates the creation of myths that in turn produce fears but this supposes in the end bringing to light what the normative conceptual categories leave out like again all of this is saying that yeah because like in times of uncertainty um, you're going to see horror because of people facing hard times. They're going to want to overcome it or whatever they feel is like going on in their lives. That's what's going to be pushed onto the public zeitgeist. And therefore creatives are going to tap into that feeling and produce horror or fantastic films around that. And then again, like I've been saying, because racist, because bad, therefore um, Kong definitely means black people, but we are honestly going to stop it there because there is there's so little to be said and there's so much bloat to all of these that's like what can really be said and then you go down you have six pages before you get to the next big point so i'll make this a little series um every few weeks we can do that because that's just it's silly it's ridiculous Seeing how she screwed, she screwed up on Kong. I don't even know how badly the botch talking about Godzilla and Mothra. Um, I'll have to look into it because probably they'll be like, "Well, Godzilla is about the anxieties, and probably Godzilla means America bad because America bombed Japan, and therefore Western power is bad." Something like that, I'd assume. If we're looking at what they did with Kong, but yeah, so. It, we only got through six pages of that. I was like, oh, we'll probably get through half of this and then we'll stop. But if we're only going to get through six, that, that means I've got a whole lot to go. But I think that's where I'll end it off because there's a lot of nonsense there and my mind can only take so much before I'm just like, nope, I'm done. But in um, the meantime, what I think... I'll say is that 
besides probably working on some blender projects in the future i think that i'll start doing some games on the channel of course i still have the i'm still working with the old laptop so if streams die because of games that's probably gonna be the case but we'll see what we can do i have some games lined up and yeah you missed the stream that's you get <laughs> oh i'm sorry bio um but it's like one of those things where i'm like i probably am gonna bring more people on for the future streams because it's like the same point i'm just bouncing the same points off myself and there isn't too much i can be like well you could maybe mean it's like no it's all stupid but i'm gonna put a poll on the community tab whether people are gonna want to see um the want to see a game or want to see me work on animations or model making or just drawing we'll see we'll see um and i'll put that on instagram as well to see what people think but yeah yeah it's a short stream it's definitely a short stream tonight um but what i'm gonna do too is that it's it's unlisted on the channel right now but at the moment, I do have finally the Godzilla and Godzilla Raids Again book review finished. That's going to be on Sakura Central tomorrow. So if people want to look at that, they'll be able to. But more than likely, I'm just going to do the upload first to um, the premiere on youtube we'll see what happens i think probably what we'll do is i'll do the simulcast on the 10th for youtube and sakura but i'm going to encourage people to look at it via sakura and then from there um there may be a few things that i'm going to be producing that are specifically for that site and i'm also working on an article for kaiju united that's been taking a while and that's also going to be transitioned into a video as well so it's a case where it's a short stream tonight, but I'm also working on a lot of actual videos down the line. I've been doing so many streams lately, and I haven't actually gotten to do a like actual videos in a while. So I want to just get back in the swing of things like that. And besides the video, since the review is now out, the Exidio video game review is I have more time working on that. Plus, I have the Kilo Kaiju review, but I also have um something else down the pipeline that i'm working on but yeah plan pain con could be a critique of chloe's back potential wire natural but that's more personal interpretation i don't think it's an actual message of the film yeah and marion c cooper never felt that that actually was um something that they were thinking of when they were working on it but that's again it's it you you really need to drink the kool-aid to think that way when it comes to the film but yeah um stay tuned and next week too so people can also keep this on the calendars um the 14th is the next kaiju roundtable so if you guys have a human character that you want us to talk about or you want to talk about a human character that you're working on for any kaiju project have that ready and we will discuss it because hopefully we don't have another fire that kills the electricity to my house and kills the stream so there's that um i want to thank um martin kasperi smith i don't think i've seen you on the streams before which in that case welcome and thank you for coming on um there's one person on facebook who loved the live that was going on facebook because i've been multi-streaming everything so you can catch me now on twitch youtube and facebook so there's that um yeah i will need gargantuan insurance to protect my house from fires but that's all for you guys um check out some other people's stuff that's gonna be going on during this week like i said the 10th is when the review is going to be coming out and i believe thursday which is the 11th is when sea monsters is another live stream i think i'll be busy then but i'll share it around for you guys because i think he does good content and like other people that i brought on he's good people so i recommend that and you all just have a great evening. Thank you for staying with me. And I'm Zimzilla, and I'll see you guys.